Hey, welcome to this video about ancient Nubia. Uh, you may recognize that name, and especially if you worked on the Egyptian side of last unit, you almost certainly recognize that name. And here's a reminder of what these overviews are about. These are about identifying some key vocabulary words, getting a big picture view of it, looking at some major themes, but there aren't going to be a lot of details or specific people. I say that. But look at this incredible picture of Pharaoh Taharqa. Um, he was at, from Nubia, and as part of the time period where Nubia took over all of Egypt, he ruled all of Egypt. Um, so that's real fascinating. We'll talk more about that in just a second. And then here are some examples of pyramids at one of the capitals of a Nubian kingdom. So here's the big picture. Uh, there's this thousand mile stretch of the Nile Valley uh, that lies between Aswan and Khartoum. Um, so that's basically between here and between down there. Uh, and that is the area that we would call Nubia. And there's a bunch of different kingdoms that pop up in that area. And we'll talk about those individually, but this is the general area we're talking about. So Egypt is like the up here bits and then Nubia is the down here bits. However, um, if you were in either of those kingdoms at these times, you would actually have this map flipped. Uh, because you remember this is Upper Egypt, so this would be Lower Nubia and then Upper Nubia. And the location of this place allowed it to serve as a corridor for trade with the areas to the south in Africa, because all the different resources and things that were coming up from there, in order to get to Egypt, that large civilization, it would have to go through this area, uh, and so it became a rather important trade region. Now, Locally, it was pretty similar to Egypt. It had this river valley that offered irrigation and the silt after all of the flooding that had happened. It had desert borders all around it, which meant a fair amount of protection from outsiders, though not as much as Egypt. It was a little bit closer to some of the areas that had nomadic um, raiders who might come and bother them. Uh, it had rich deposits of gold and copper and gems, as you might imagine, that'd be very useful and uh, was part of the reason they became a powerful trade force in the world. Uh, Northern Nubia in particular, though, is really like severely hot and dry, which means that in order to have enough water, you either need to have irrigation directly from the river, or you'll see later they were able to do some cool uh, building reservoirs and catching rainwater uh, when it did fall, things like that. Uh, where the river bends, there are particularly large floodplains, which made it fertile, and so a lot of the settlements were focused in those areas. Also, one of the reasons that it became such a powerful uh, force for trade was that it had these things called cataracts. So those are areas within a river. Actually, it's very similar to Richmond. Richmond has one of these, where there are rocks in the river, rapids, that mean you can't go any further upriver without taking your boat out and around, and it meant that you had to stop there, and maybe you would trade while you were there. Right? So Nubia has six cataracts, six different areas that you'd have to get out and go around. Uh, and so as they became masters of those cataracts, they also became masters of the trade that would go up and down the river. Uh, so here's the timeline. In the 3000s BCE, uh, that's when we start to see the development of uh, sedentary farming towns. People definitely lived there before that time, but this is when we have evidence of them settling down. Uh, they traded even at that time in ivory, which comes from the tusks of animals, you know, elephants and rhinos, and also ebony, which is a kind of wood. And you can see that right here, really dark interior that can be made into some really beautiful objects. In around 2300 BC, that's the first mention that we have uh, recorded about Nubia. It was written by uh, Egyptians, and often those inscriptions talk about uh, trade missions or incursions or fighting off Nubians. Uh, like it, it was a contentious relationship at different times. And during that time, we also see the addition of gold, slaves, and exotic animals to the trade routes. Uh, 1750, Kush rises. That's one of the major kingdoms. Its capital was at Kerma, and you can actually see a diagram down here of Kerma's royal palace. You can see that in the royal palace, there were cattle pens. I think that's fascinating. Now, there are also grain silos, which shows you the importance of controlling food resources for those rulers. Uh, then in, in 1532, we have a new kingdom of Egypt, which conquers Kush. Uh, and Kush falls, but you have a later kingdom develop in about 800 because uh, Egypt starts to have some political infighting troubles and uh, this lower 
kingdom of the area of Nubia is able to rise, and it has a new capital at uh, Meroe. And that is how you say that, Meroe. I just watched that in a video. Now, um, the kings of Meroe at one point rule all of Egypt from about 712 to 660 BCE. And you'll see more about that in a story later. Uh, 660 through 350, and notice that's CE. So we've crossed over zero and we've gone all the way to there. Meroe remains a solid kingdom as the world changes around. It goes through lots of changes. It's a big, fascinating story. But in general, this is the big overview of their timeline that we will address. Now, there's social patterns. The Egyptians occupied almost all of this area for 700 years, and they left deep marks on society, and they would have anyway because they were such close neighbors. Um, they're the tombs that are in Nubia, the embalming they used, uh, the evidence we have of their belief in an afterlife, their gods and goddesses, um, they're similar. They have unique features, though. It's not like it's just a one-for-one -one copy. Um, Nubia was made up of a diverse group of different African peoples, and you see that in Egyptian inscriptions, um, where you can see different skin colors of those visiting peoples as they were like doing trade missions and things like that. Uh, they had similar social structures to Egypt in terms of that hierarchy that we've seen before, but women were more highly regarded and even could be religious leaders and were important in religious ceremonies. Also, archery was an important part of their culture, and in fact, the Egyptian name for this area was Taseti, which meant the land of the bow. Nubia, by the way, uh, means like the land where gold is from, the land of gold, which is, uh, both of those are cool things to be named. And down here you can see an inscription of a female ruler conquering some enemies. Now, political patterns in these kingdoms differed between each of the times that they rose into independent power, but in general, uh, a strong state developed to control trade because it was so valuable and to fight off the desert nomads who were attracted to the valuable objects and Egyptian invasions who were coming in for the same reasons. They had some major settlements that were the capitals, those Kerma, Napata, and Meroe. Uh, they had, similar to Egypt, very powerful kings who organized big building projects. And we even have early evidence of there being elaborate sacrifices, you know, like dozens of people being sacrificed into burials uh, in this area. Also, they believed that their kings were god kings, similar to Egypt. Uh, and rulers often depicted themselves with Egyptian clothes and objects. But they had local names, like they kept their, their local Nubian names, and they're shown with African features. Um, and it's a little hard to see because it's sort of uh, hard lighting in here. But they're, you know, African features in, tor in terms of definitely being from people who are from sub-Saharan Africa, having like darker skin um, and other facial features associated with folks from those areas. Also, uh, differently, they had matrilineal succession. Matra means like mater, like mother, so through a mother. Kings were succeeded by the son of their sister, which I thought was really fascinating. Um, and you can see that that indicates that, you know, women had a different level of power in the society, most likely. In fact, from Meroe, a later kingdom, we have a specific title for a female ruler. Uh, Kandache or Kandake, I think is how you say that. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> Just out here doing my best. Now, uh, in terms of their economic patterns, uh, they were renowned as skilled craftsmen, uh, metal workers, and their pottery was like better than Egypt's at a given uh, time period. That's some of the early work that we have from them. And then under Egyptian occupation, Nubian workers were pretty severely exploited in the mines because the Egyptians were there to conquer and get the gold and the gems and the other resources. But when they had the ability to manage their own society, they built extensive irrigation systems, including half years, which are rain reservoirs. You can see an example of that up here. It's basically like a ditch in the ground with uh, mud walls built up to keep in the rains uh, from the rainy season, which would then slowly be used and dry out over time. So it's, you know, it's like a big pool, but it's a big deal. Like if you don't have water, you die. So they figured out a way to do this in a large scale. Um, they grew grains, uh, lentils, peas, dates, maybe melons. We have some evidence of melons. Uh, they did a lot of cattle herding. And cattle herding wasn't just a way to have meat. It was a way to have some insurance. Because if your crops failed, then you were able to use them as a fallback source of food. Um, also, cattle herding and milk drinking uh, became later a part of society. It was rather important. Uh, 
And in terms of what they imported and exported, because again, they were a really important trading center, they exported gold, ivory, cattle, wood, incense, dates. Uh, incense is like um, a particular kind of wood and oils that you would burn for it to smell nice. Uh, and they imported things they weren't able to make there, things uh, like certain kinds of oils, uh, wine, beer, linens, and manufactured goods. And a lot of that was coming from Egypt, that direct trade partner. In terms of what they left behind, scholars used to think of Nubia as an outlying region of Egypt. They're like, yeah, we'll study Egypt, but like, you know, Nubia was a group that Egypt interacted with. And that's in part because we only had evidence from Egyptian sources, by and large, in order to understand Nubian history. And there's also lots of issues about the, you know, racism being a part of how uh, those early scholars saw this area. They Egypt was, you know, a not as black-skinned area, and so they were then uh, assuming that Egypt was the center of civilization and Nubia was just kind of copying them. So you can see how the people who were studying later brought their own beliefs to that studying, uh, and in that case, it resulted in us not knowing as much about Nubia as we might otherwise know. Um, lots of early information about Nubia comes from those written sources, even today, and I would point out, like, they fought each other. They were rivals. Egypt occupied Nubia for a very long time. So you have to be cautious about how you interpret sources about Nubia that are from Egypt. So especially as you're interpreting primary sources from there, you have to be very um, maybe suspicious of like what the Egyptians are saying, why they're saying it, and things like that. Uh, for example, over here, you see a picture from a tomb from an Egyptian bureaucrat with his life story, including an expedition to Nubia. So even the bureaucrats, the like mid-level people were getting in on this game. Uh, the Nubian 25th dynasty of Egypt, that's uh, Tarka, who we mentioned earlier, that is the, the time in which Nubian kings controlled all of Egypt. They left lots of records and big monuments and things like that. So we have a fair amount of evidence from that time period. And then the rise of Meroe, they built a lot of pyramids and other larger structures and left behind more written records. Um, and in fact, a, a fair amount of written records. Problem is, it's still undeciphered. Undeciphered means we cannot read it yet. And it's, the script is right down here. We don't know what it says. So unfortunately, there's lots that we're missing about this civilization right now. And also, archaeological work in Nubia is relatively recent, especially uh, focusing on those kingdoms that weren't part of Egypt. Um, and large excavations at Meroe only began in like 2002. Ugh, wild. So we would know a lot more if we had started earlier and if people had uh, been more interested in these African kingdoms. And this is one of the reasons it's included in this class is because it is a civilization that is worth studying. So I hope you've learned a lot of good stuff about Nubia and I'll see you in the next one.